you're watching Gears. Space. The final frontier. At least that was the thought in the early 60s when America committed itself to putting a man on the moon. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. But committing the country to a space race is one thing. Finding people that can actually pull that off, that's a whole nother deal. So the question becomes, where do you find a bunch of rocket scientists when rocket science doesn't exist yet? Simple, you grab a bunch of gearheads and you have them figure it out and make it happen. Oh, this is gonna be great. The Mercury program was up first. And the rockets and equipment were as rude and crude as the men that flew them. But in spite of this and numerous setbacks, the program was successful and put the first American rockets in space and made national heroes out of the astronauts inside. But that wasn't enough. Remember, these are basically hot rodders we're talking about here. And every hot rodder has the desire to go faster and further. So next came the Gemini program that not only continued to push the envelope of space, but also the boundaries of the equipment and the men required to run it. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Finally came the Apollo program and the mighty Saturn V rocket with over a million horsepower. And even though the drag racing world was serving up some pretty spectacular burnouts at the time, the world had never seen a launch or a burnout like what the Saturn V was capable of doing. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Neil Armstrong reporting that we're on a pitch program with the Apollo 11. And Sonny Morea was one of the engineers that helped make it happen. I started in the area of, of heat transfer and thermodynamics within the propulsion field. And it was shortly thereafter that they gave me the task of, of doing the engineering work with Rocketdyne on the development of the H1 engine. When the Saturn V program was approved and Kennedy made the announcement we were going to the moon, at that point they were searching very quickly for some American young guys who, who knew something about management, knew something about engines. And with that, America finally had the means to put a man on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Now, for a lot of people, they think this is the end of the story, but it's not. Because even though the astronauts found they could move around on the moon, they couldn't move around well enough to explore it properly. They needed some sort of transportation, a moon buggy. But it needed to be different than anything anybody had ever seen before. And this is where the rocket scientists came full circle back to their automotive roots. I get another call from Von Braun's office this time saying, you know, he says, um, we have a, a new project that we're, we're trying to convince NASA headquarters to approve. And it's a car that we're going to put on the moon. Would you be interested in managing that program? And he said, the only problem is it has got to be done in, in a very short period of time. You've got less than two years. And I said, well, you know, my whole field is, is rocketry. I don't know anything about automobiles, except I drive one, probably not very well. He says, you know, you've been managing a program that had run out costs of a billion dollars. He says, surely you have no problem managing a little $40 million project. So you know, I saluted and said, yes, sir. <laughs> Because of the extremely limited space on the rocket, 
the restrictions for the moon buggy were severe. It had to weigh less than 500 pounds and fold up into a four foot cubic space, but then unfold into a full size vehicle that would carry two astronauts and their equipment using only electric power. The resulting vehicle was so unique and well engineered, it was used on the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 missions with no mechanical breakdowns. And that's a good thing, because it's really hard to get AAA to make a surface call to the moon. The uh, commander, Gene Cernan, uh, uh, unfortunately uh, and accidentally, of course, broke the fender off the rover early on, right after we had uh, deployed it. And we had to operate the first excursion first EVA with the uh, fender not there, and so we were getting a lot of dust coming uh, forward and onto the lunar rover. And the uh, people on the ground uh, went to work and figured out <clears throat> for us how to tape some maps together and uh, clamp them on the, on the remaining part of the fender. So that, that worked very well as a dust flap. So not only did we put a man on the moon, but we also shipped up a stripped down hot rod so we could drive around on it. Now, since the moon buggy was such a big deal, NASA figured that the best way to encourage young engineers to think outside the box and solve problems was to have an annual moon buggy race that had homemade buggies that were built to a criteria similar to the original moon buggy. This is something you got to see. Hey, welcome back to Gears and our unique coverage of the Great Moon Buggy Race, a race that's put together by NASA to test the skills and the creativity of young engineers. Every year in the spring, teams from high schools and colleges around the world descend on the Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama for the Great Moon Buggy Race. 18 years ago, there was a bright young man called Bill Hallisey who uh, came up with the idea that, you know, we ought to commemorate that automobile that went to the moon called the Lunar Rolling Vehicle by having a, a competition here on Earth and let high school get involved and see if we can't generate some interest in the science and mathematics area. The rules are simple. Build a vehicle that will fold into a four-foot square space carry two people, be human powered, and be able to negotiate an obstacle course in the quickest amount of time. Not an easy task. <laughs> oh, I didn't have anything left. Yeah, now how about you? I'm pretty good. I've done it the past three years. So I'm gonna vomit. <laughs> you know if you vomit, that will guarantee that you get on TV. Yeah. <laughs> But these students are definitely up for the challenge. I've been getting well, a little stressed out lately. I bet. Everybody gets one thing after another, it seems like. But yeah. that's the fun of it, honestly. It's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. These guys, like, I've seen them say colorful words. I've seen them get so mad at each other. The next day, they're like, you know what, man? It's good. We got it working. We're fine. Yeah. The designs of the buggies are as diverse as the teams themselves. We have a three wheel design that is has. All the wheels driven, yeah. it's all suspended, and we have front, front and back, back brakes. These steering levers um, that are nice and uh, easy to use. And then we have the brakes for both the back and the front. Articulation in, in the middle so that whenever you go over the big rocks and stuff, yeah. you keep, uh, keep your center of gravity. Can you pop a wheelie with this thing? Well, yeah, actually, we've, we've done, done it. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've done it with some carrying the two passengers side by side, some in tandem, and some in completely opposite directions. The thing that is similar in the machines is that they all use some sort of bicycle chains, sprockets, and shifting mechanism to make the buggy move. Uh, they are learning things that a lot of young people don't get a chance to learn. They learn how to use their hands and use tools what tools do, how to use your hands, how to use your brain and your hands and your eyes simultaneously. And that, that's what being a human being is all about.
The means of propulsion is, of course, human. And the rules state that the riding team must consist of a male and female. And since the goal here is to win the race, both riders must be in top shape to make it through the obstacle course that NASA's put together. The course is designed to mimic obstacles that you might find on the moon. So once the teams pass the size and assembly challenges, the real race begins. And with squirrely steering, skinny tires, and flailing arms and legs, the buggies and racers attack the course. But sometimes, the course attacks them back. And when the dust finally clears, a winner is announced. And that school has the bragging rights of winning the great moon buggy race. But everybody goes home with the experience of building one of the most unique vehicles on the planet to compete in one of the most unique races on any planet. And speaking of one of the most unique vehicles on the planet, how cool would it be to find one of those old vintage moon buggies and stuff a big old Hemi in it? Man, that would be the ultimate hot rod. And I know where a couple of those are sitting. Completely rust-free, forgotten about, abandoned. The ultimate barn find. We just have to figure out a way to get our trailer up there. You know, without a doubt, one of the most popular vehicles that we've ever done on Gears is Sergeant Rock, a big, massive World War II truck that we're building to pay tribute to all the men and women that have ever served in the military. Now, so far, we have the drivetrain laid out, the suspension's done, the body's finished. Now we're going to turn our attention to the bed and some of the details we're going to do back here. Now, since this thing sits so high, the question of where we're going to mount the fuel tank becomes pretty important. And the answer to that question comes in finding the right fuel tank. Come on. Now, since we don't have room to mount a tank under the bed, we're going to have to put a tank in the bed. And this is a universal fuel tank that comes from Speedway Motors that's designed specifically for that kind of application. Now, this is a high-quality aluminum tank. It's got baffles built into it to keep fuel slosh to a minimum. And you've got your flange here for your sending unit, you've got your filler neck, and you've got your ins and outs. Then, of course, on the bottom, you've got flanges to mount to any flat surface. So basically, all you have to do with this, figure out where you're going to put it, drill some holes, bolt it in. We're going to set it up against the front of the bed for now to get it out of the way. To fill the tank, we also got this remote filler neck assembly from Speedway Motors and some stainless steel two-inch tubing from Stainless Works. And we're going to use these to build a filler neck that runs through the outer panel and into the fuel tank so we can actually fill this thing up at a service station. And that brings up this. Now, Quick Tip. Brought to you by E3 Spark Plugs. Born to burn. A lot of people wonder, why would you go to the extra expense of using stainless steel tubing when you're building filler necks or cooling tubes when you can pick up regular steel anywhere and it's cheaper? Well, there's a few reasons here. Check this out. Stainless steel is incredibly strong and durable, and it has better corrosion resistance than regular steel, so it's going to last longer. But one of the big benefits is how nicely it polishes out when you hit it with a buffing wheel. So you have performance and looks all in one choice. If you can afford stainless steel, it's definitely the way to go. If you'd like to learn more tips to make your life easier in the shop, check out the tips page on the website. Okay, for power, we're gonna run a pair of these Optima yellow top batteries so we not only have plenty of power for the engine of that thing, but also to run all the accessories like those machine guns. <laughs> Now, obviously, we don't want to just mount these things out in the weather, so we need to put them into some sort of a box. And that is where these finned aluminum battery boxes come in that we got from O'Brien Truckers. Now, these are designed to fit an Optima battery. So basically, you stick the battery in, and you put the lid on, that seals it up. 
then these outlets here fit these waterproof terminals so you can make your connections. If you're going to run an Optima battery and you need to have it sealed from the weather, this is about the coolest box you can put it in. And only O'Brien's Truckers has these. Now obviously if we're running dual batteries, we want to be able to control those batteries. So we went to Painless Performance, got one of their dual battery kits that allows you to go from a single battery to both batteries with just the flick of a switch. And then finally, it's always a good idea to have a power cutoff. So we went to Watson Streetworks and got this master power shut off so we can shut off all the power to the vehicle with just a flip of a switch. Now, once we get all this stuff mounted in here, that'll put us one step closer to finally putting the fire to this thing. Parts Bin, brought to you by Royal Purple, the performance oil that outperforms. When you're building a vehicle, whether it's original or custom or an off-roader, it's pretty important to figure out what kind of seats you're going to put in it. Because seats don't just give you comfort and style, they also have to perform on par with the vehicle. And the guys at Cirillo Seats understand this. And they've got a whole line of seats to fit pretty much whatever you might be working on. For example, this is what they call the XR3 sport seat. Now check these out. They've got pronounced bolsters here on the bottom and back here on the back to help hold you in place during hard cornering. We've got slots up here so you can run a harness. And of course, they have a fully adjustable back. Now Cirillo also offers all kinds of options as far as upholstery and colors so you can actually match the seats to your vehicle. If you're ready to get serious about your seats, Cirillo is a company you need to call. You know, we get a lot of people that look at our slot car set here and go, man, I'd love to have something like this. I just don't have the room. Well, maybe not for something quite this big, but you definitely have the room for something like this. These are Carrera's new 1 32nd scale digital slot car sets. Now, these are designed to not only get you up and racing quickly, but also enjoying the benefits of full digital control. Check this out. This means that you can change lanes, cut people off, run them off the track, as well as actually control the braking and acceleration of the cars. All those things that you could never do with those old slot car sets. All of this in a kit that sets up and tears down in just a few minutes. Also, if you are a classic sports car nut, this is about the only place where you can pit a vintage Cheetah against a vintage Cobra and actually find out which one was the fastest. If you want a toy, get some Legos. But if you want to get into the slot car hobby and have a track that'll last you for years and will expand with your space, you need to go to Carrera and get rolling. When you're building a custom vehicle, sometimes you need a really unique wheel to fit it. Whether it's a 20 by 18 beadlock wheel for really big tires or something crazy for an amphibious military vehicle, Marsh Racing Wheels can build whatever you want, whatever size you can dream up. For example, here's some 15 by 14s for this British Super Cat, which means it needed special backspacing and a special bolt pattern. Now, Marsh Racing Wheels has been building heavy-duty, high-performance motorsport wheels since 1955. So if you want something that's going to handle it, Marsh can build it for you. Now, another thing that's been around for a long time is the Interco Bogger Tire. And one look, and you can see why. With lugs that looks like it came off of a tractor, these things will dig to China if you stay on the gas long enough. And if you try to run them down the street, they'll howl like a pack of dogs. This is a real off-road tire. If you need the ultimate in traction in mud and sand, you need to get yourself a set of boggers. What are you working on? Brought to you by Dake. If you have a dream, we have the tools. Today's What Are You Working On comes from Rick DeMons from Omaha, Nebraska. And when it comes to vehicles, Rick says that he's always liked two things. He liked the Blue Angels C-130 Fat Albert and the Pro Street Look. 
So Rick said he picked himself up a 1966 F100 pickup and decided to make his own street version of Fat Albert. Now check out this truck. This thing was pretty rough when he started, but it was all there, so it was the perfect project. So the first thing he did was put in a Camaro front subframe to get some handling on this thing and get some good brakes underneath it. Then he stuffed in a Pontiac 400 engine just to be a little different. And fortunately, he had a lot of good help in the form of his son. The interior was also completely gone through, so it would be a little more comfortable than your typical farm truck. And after all the paint and bodywork was done, this is what he rolled out, his own version of Fat Albert. <laughs> yeah. Now, a lot of people like this thing, including a lot of judges. Check out this. And you know his son is going to cherish that trophy forever. Now, Rick says it took him 12 years to do this project, and he couldn't have done it without a lot of great friends and a very understanding wife. And as you can see by this picture, it is now Rick's turn to be very understanding with the keys to the truck. <laughs> Rick, you should have bought her a diamond, man. <laughs> now, obviously, Rick, you do a lot of metal work, so what we're going to do, we're going to give you a brand new Dake Arbor Press to help you out on your next project. And we're going to give you a year subscription to Hot Rod Magazine so you can get some ideas for your next project. Now, for the rest of you guys, if you'd like to get involved in this, maybe get your project featured on the show, maybe get some of this stuff, you've got to send some pictures in to what he's working on. We'll do our best to get it on the air. Also, don't forget to check us out on Twitter and Facebook. We've always got something going on there, too. Now, the time has come for you to get out in the garage and twist some wrenches. We'll see you next time.